So I'm Lloyd. I work for SHARP, uh, which is Statistical Center for HIV Research and Prevention in Seattle. Um, I've been a Postgres DBA for the last 18 years. While SHARP doesn't use GIS, at my previous job, which was a charter airlines, we did geospatial math uh, to calculate distance between airports, to then be able to turn that into flight time and turn that into uh, dollars, amount to, uh, to charge for the flight. And I did that with the spherical law of cosines uh, because we didn't have GIS installed. So I'm going to talk about how to do this math, aviation math, with the spherical law of cosines or with the Haberstein formula. I'm going to show both. And then I'm going to show how much simpler it is to use post-GIS instead. It makes the query so much simpler. And you could also do PG routing if you wanted to. Um, this is actually a map for the airlines. They use uh, maps like this, although big airlines actually use the high altitude version that I have over there. This is a low altitude version. Um, and you can see they have vectors between airports marked on these maps. And that's your road in the sky that the airlines fly. And if you actually uh, put those vectors into Postgres, you could use PG routing to determine the fastest route along the vectors, uh, to, uh, which you would then use to file your flight plan. So, okay, so the things we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about how to install PostGIS. Um, you can do it uh, from the cloud solutions, you can do it from source. We're going to talk about data sets that are free and open source that you can go grab such as the Tiger data set, which is your US Census data. Uh, we're going to talk about your world data, which allows you to grab the maps and country boundaries from all over the world. And we're going to also talk about TIFFs, which are TIFFs that you can load up in the background that give you an underlying map to go underneath your data. We're going to talk about the aviation map, including airline taxes. Um, and we're going to show how to display your data, such as in QGIS, uh, which is another open source product, uh, Google Maps, uh, Bing API, I don't show it, but I, uh, you can do it in that. And Amazon has an API for their, I think it's their Fire Stick, uh, if you want to show it up on their Fire Stick. I do have a lot of slides that have this notepad in the upper right hand corner. If you see that notepad, there are extra notes for that slide, and you want to download my presentation from our website because there are a lot of links to these data sets, extra notes about what I'm talking about on those specific pages. So definitely come uh, download the presentation. So installing Postgres, there are many ways to install PostGIS. Uh, one of the easiest ways is if you're using a uh, Windows development system is to download Enterprise Stack DB Stack Builder um, because then you can tell to install it. Now the nice thing about it, it actually installs a GUI interface for uploading shape files into Postgres, uh, which a lot of your data sets that you're going to get are in shape files. Um, I have also used Big SQL's uh, version, uh, they just do the command line uh, shapefile uh, loader. They don't have the Windows one on there, although I've talked to an Amazon engineer about Amazon uh, hosting a copy of the uh, Windows and Mac and, and Unix GUI interface versions of, of the shapefile loader. I've also seen some people have uh, problems with the OSX. If they install one and botch the install and then try installing uh, a different one, that the two uh, will cause inner problems together. And you really have to go in and clean everything out and then do a fresh, fresh one. I'm not a Mac person, so. <laughs> um, but I, I, I heard one specific guy who was having a problem with it. Um, and we've, I've done compilations for OpenSUSE. Um, it's, it's work, but it's not that hard. In fact, we're going to talk about how to do that. So basically, you need to install these extra packages before you can compile PostGIS. 
And then once you have those packages installed, then you just have to untar the package, do a configure, make, and make install. So it's pretty simple, but, what, but you just got to get the pre res requests on your machine first, which you may have to do the installs for those too. Now, in the cloud, Amazon supports many versions of it because uh, they support many versions of Postgres. So they deal with PostGIS all the way back to 218, uh, all the way up to 242 in the uh, 10 series of Postgres. And they support PG routing, uh, which is your, um, you know, driving on roads, you know, you get your turn-by-turn -turn type directions. Google supports the PostGIS, but they do not support the PG routing. Microsoft supports both, although I don't know the version numbers for the, uh, for the PostGIS and the Microsoft one yet. Although I was just at um, PostgresConf in New York last week, and they gave me some credits to go log in so I can pull the information from their system and display. Uh, the nice thing is Amazon, actually this, for every extension, for every version of Postgres, they actually list the version numbers on their documentation. And they actually had a bug in their documentation last week, uh, which hopefully they got fixed this week because uh, I talked to them about it in, uh, in New York. And the uh, Postgres 9512 was actually listed as uh, version 1.0. And it was a bug when they uh, created the documentation, but they had the uh, engineer who actually compiles Postgres for Amazon come talk to me about it. And he went and looked at that specific instance to see what it was and found out, no, it was the 225 and that their documentation was wrong and so they are updating their documentation. Census Bureau data, shapefiles. So there are many types of shapefiles you can get for free from the U.S. Census Bureau. Um, well, I've got them listed here. Uh, now, the areas that, we, uh, that I'm going to use in this example are basically the states and equivalents and the counties here. Um, but you can do it by zip code. You can do it by all sorts of areas if you want. You can also download the roads or the railways, uh, things like that if you want. And there are some differences between the tiger shape files for states and counties versus uh, the world data set, and I will show you that visually later on. Uh, currently, you only have access to the 2017, they haven't published the 2018 data yet. Now, to get this data, you're going to need WGET and 7-zip, uh, and I've got links for downloading those in the notes. And if you download the Enterprise DB, uh, version, there is a thing to in, uh, install a sample PostGIS database. If you do that, there will be a couple of tables in there. Uh, one is tiger loader variables that you can put your tiger year into. You can put the website address for the tiger, uh, a staging folder for your downloads, and your data and staging schemas inside your database. And uh, it will actually generate your download script. Big gotcha on this, don't use HTTP, use FTP. If you try and download their entire data set via HTTP, they will block you. They block me on it. Um, and, but if you do FTP, they won't block you. Another way to go grab them quickly is use like um, S FTP and just go download the whole directory structure uh, for the 2017 data. There's the FTP address there. And um, depending on which version of the Enterprise DB you get, you can get the PostGIS 24 sample database or the PostGIS 23 or 24. So. Yeah. Now, the other table that you want to modify is Tiger Loader Platform. And in this, you want to set where your Postgres binary lives, which mine lives in an odd location, uh, Postgres port. And I normally run uh, all the different versions of Postgres on my desktop because I'm testing against them all. So each one will have its own port number, so I'm <laughs> running non-standard port, so I want to change that. Uh, put in my Postgres user name and password. 
And uh, wget, uh, if you need to point to its specific uh, install location, you want to set that too. Um, oh, and you'll see um, uh, sample records in there for SH uh, for Windows and, um, and one for Linux. Just make a copy of those and put your own name on it uh, when, when you edit these. Okay, now how you then do, the, do use it is you run a loader, a loader generate nation script and give it the name for that last table for the row in it and output it to loader.bat or loader.sh depending on whether you're using the Linux or Windows. And that will generate your script file which then you just execute and it will actually download all the files and a shape file and shove them up into Postgres for you automatically so you don't need to run the shape to Postgres SQL manually. It, it will do it all automated for you. It'll, it'll build everything you need. But you can run this manually. And with the shape file, one of the big gotchas is not all shape files are the same geographic coordinate location, uh, which is your SRID. Um, the thing is, individual states normally have their own XY starting coordinate position. So what you need to do is, when you load it, set the SRID value of the data set that you are loading. Then you can do a transformation after it's loaded into the, a global data day, uh, one for the whole globe if you want, so that you can cross states to, together. Now this is the GUI interface that I was talking about that's available with the Enterprise DB. It's also available in the source uh, PostGIS if you want to install it. So first thing you want to do is uh, go to view connection details and input in your host name, port name, username, password, database name. And uh, once you leave that, it will say down here, connections uh, succeeded. Then you want to add your file and you add your shape file. This is our, one of the global administration database ones, admin zero, so this is country level data, where admin one is your state level data, admin two is your county level data. Um, and you want to set the RSRID of this data set that you're loading. So this field you just fill in manually. And if the table already exists, you tell it don't create it. If it's a brand new table, you tell it to create it. Uh, you can also, Click options here and switch it. This says genome here. You can also switch it to say geography. And there's a big difference in that. A flat map, if you're looking at the distance between two locations, you want ge geometry. If you are looking at uh, the flight distance between two locations, you want geography, so you do the great circle map. So there's two types, and you want the correct one depending on what you're doing. You want the geometry if you're asking, is this airport within this county or state? To get the distance, you want geography. Oh, and by the way, geometry points, you can actually also add an altitude to them if you want to. So when we're loading in the uh, database, we're going to actually set the airport elevation. Okay, so now uh, we can look at the Tiger data set and we can do a simple query here. We can take our state data and join it to our county data and say what counties are covered by this state, where state is Washington. And it will list all the counties in Washington state. Um, so that's, that's how simple it can be to query GIS data. Um, you can also do a contains, uh, which is this version. It'll give you the same set of results. Let's see. So the world data that I was talking about, this is the link to download it. But and it have they have six different levels of data, and you can download a combined file. But if you're using applications like GIS uh, QGIS. You may only wish to load one level of it, so I like to uh, have each file individual. 
And admin zero is your country, admin one is your state, admin two is county. I don't use three through five myself, um, but they are available. But they're only for certain parts of the world, they're not everywhere. We talked about this, um, geometry through versus geography. Already talked about that. So, let's talk about airplane map. So this is your great circle uh, map. Spherical law of cosines versus Haberstein formula. They are complex, and, and this is actually a simplified version because these Latin longs need to actually be in radians, not in the normal format. So you need to take each one of these, uh, multiply it by pi divided by 180. So this formula for every single one of these locations, which makes this even more complex of a query. And then the output is in radians, and you need to convert that into nautical miles, which we do by multiplying the output by 180 times 60 divided by pi. And now, uh, some people will want the nautical meters instead of nautical miles. We use the nautical miles here in the US. And in the charter airlines that I worked for, we used the spherical uh, cosines uh, in, in, our, in the queries that I was writing because I didn't have access to the GIS at the time there. So let's talk about how to take those uh, distances now and actually how to use them in GIS. So we're going to talk about a bunch of the different basics of GIS and then we'll go into an actual query. So ST distance will give us the distance between two points. Um, and they're listed up here, uh, how to use it. Uh, you can get it to return in degrees, meters, uh, and there's a special optional flag to say use spheroid, but the world is not a sphere. So we don't, you actually don't want to use uh, the spheroid, spheroid flag, even though it's faster to do the calculations, uh, is not correct. And then you can take that and turn that into your nautical miles and say, okay, is this less than 3,000 nautical miles or is this airport's within flight distance of our aircraft? Um, uh, so that returns as meters, which you then divide by 1,000 to get your kilometers and divide by 0.53996 to get your nautical miles. STD within uh, is, is, an, is another variation that you can use where you can say, okay, I've got the, uh, our originating airport, our destination airport, and is it within 3,000 nautical miles, uh, the destinations of the originating airport. And then you times it by 1852 to get your meters. And, you, and also don't want to use the spheroid uh, version of it. ST contains we're going to use also because we want to see if this airport's within the state. Why are we interested in what state the airport's in? Taxes. If Hawaii and Alaska have higher taxes uh, to fly into than the continental United States. Also, if it's not inside the United States and one end of the leg is inside the United States and one's end leg is outside the United States, it's even higher. Uh, tax. Although if both legs are outside the United States, you don't pay uh, the U.S. tax on it. Okay, so if we've got a longitude and latitude, how do we turn that into a point that we can use? You use ST point and give it your long and lat. Uh, and you can also uh, give it a, an elevation in there too um, with make point. So then you do long lat or long lat and elevation. Once you've created your genome or or uh, geography point, you need to set the SRID of it. So you can do set SRID and give it your genome or geography field and give it your SRID. So this bottom one is for your Geometry, and the top one, I specifically cast it to geography. And we are 
you, uh, so also I was talking about the SRIDs and the data sets. So when you get the Tiger census data for the states, it's in 4269, where when you look at the world, it's 4326. So these are different, and the thing you're going to want to do so that you can actually use them together is you want to do a transformation on the 4269 to 4326. If you don't do that, you won't, you're not able to use the math properly. Um, and you don't want to do the transformation in your query because transformation is slow. So you want to do a one-time transformation after you load your data and do your conversion from one SRID to the SRID that you're going to use for all your data inside your database. Okay, so this is a basic airport table, although we have a lot more information in, in it uh, that's not visible. Uh, we're going to need the airport name, the identifier of the airport, the longitude, latitude. What type of fuel does the airport have? Does it have as, as have gas, or does it have jet A fuel, or does it have both? Uh, depending on the size of the airplane you fly, you'll want one fuel or the other. Um, Challenger 601, you're going to want jet A. If you're flying um, in one of the small twin seater planes, it's most likely avgas. Uh, we have the elevation of the airport, so we can actually specify that when we create a point. Um, what sectional map it's on, these are sectional maps for the pilots. Runway length. Uh, the bigger the plane, the more runway you need. And it's especially important in places like, not Scottsdale, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm blanking on the name of the airport. Um, but there's an airport uh, north of Scottsdale up in the, uh, that if you want to fly a long distance out of it, you've got to fly out early in the morning before it gets too hot because the heat uh, will create less lift, meaning you need a longer runway. And so uh, we've had flights out of there where we had to leave early in the morning because in, in, in the afternoon, we wouldn't be able to take the, get the airplane off the runway. You'd actually fly off and just crash. Uh, rural airports. Uh, rural airports don't pay, pay segment tax. So like uh, one out in, um, Monroe or Snohomish, these small airports, uh, they're a, little, a lot of times little family run businesses. You don't pay the segment tax for those airports. Okay, so now if you've got the airport database in, by the way, I do give a link to how to download the database, although it's in the Microsoft Access format, so you have to have a tool <laughs> to convert it into uh, Postgres, which I have. Um, so what, what we want to do is we want to alter the table and add our geography point to it. Uh, we'll set it up as a point Z so that we can do our midpoint where we do the longitude, latitude, and elevation. Um, by the way, you'll notice my zero minus long. If that is because the airport database I'm using has the longs inverted. And so we're actually having to do a correction on that and it took me a couple of days to figure this out because I used the same database before for the airlines and it wasn't a problem because I was going from the database to the database and it was just fine if the world's upside down. But when I want to compare it to states that are right side up and my airports are upside down, that becomes a problem. So I had to fix it here. Uh, also, create an index on your geography point. And this is where you use GIST or GIN indexes. Um, and then I also wanted to do it as, a, uh, the first one was geography, and then we also want to do it as geometry. Why do we want to do both? Is because we want to compare it to the states. And in this particular case, I was only dealing with the United States on the flat map, so I did the 4269. Um, but, you know, I, really my recommendation would be the 4326. Get everything just set to the world globe. We already talked about geometry versus geography. Aircraft performance. So when you want to figure out your flight, you basically you need to know how fast does the airplane fly? How far can it fly? What's the max number of people it can fly? That pay, plays into taxes. What's the max weight it can fly? And by the way, you can only do 
uh, either max weight or max fuel. You can't do both. Um, how much does it cost to fly per nautical hour? What type of fuel does the airplane use? What's the minimum runway length that the airplane can handle? So we're going to take Challenger 601. These are nice, nice aircraft. Uh, we had them in executive configuration. So ours sat 9 to 12 people with 1 to 2 um, uh, jump seats uh, for stewards on board. Uh, in an airline configuration, they'd seat 24. So these, uh, these are the nice ones where the seats rotate 180 degrees. You can lie them back. There's a couch on board. Uh, uh, things like that. So, uh, max fuel range, it runs 3,370 nautical miles. Max payload, it will do 2,182 nautical miles. We normally don't run max payload uh, on these. So, I'm going to pick 3,000 nautical miles as a good distance in between to say we'll do these airports. How fast does it fly? It'll cruise at 425 nautical miles per hour at top speed but you don't want to run your engines at top speed all the time. It's bad on the engines. So we'll pick 400 nautical miles per hour as our cruising speed. Minimum runway length is 2,850 feet. Um, we like to do a 5,000 foot runway for that plane, um, you know, especially when it's in hot climates. So we're just going to say, we're going to skip all the airports below 5,000 uh, feet in length. Fuel, it uses Jet A fuel. Um, our biggest one had was a 12-passenger plane. Oh, by the way, the difference between uh, whether it's a 9-passenger or a 10-passenger plane is whether it's got a flight data recorder. 10 passengers or more require a flight data recorder on board the airplane. Uh, 9 or less does not. We had a big fight with the FAA in Seattle over this issue. We got a Challenger 601 that had 9 passenger seats two jumps, crew only jump seats, and two pilot seats. And Seattle wanted to count it as a 10 or more, and, but it came off as charter certificate as nine or less. And it didn't have a flight data recorder in it, and they wanted us to add that to it, and all this other stuff that they were making us go through. And we ended up going through the Freedom of Information Act and finding out Washington, D.C. was telling Seattle, this aircraft is a nine or less. We repeat, this aircraft is a nine or less. And then Seattle would come and tell us, Washington, D.C. told us it's a 10 or more. So we actually got permission to move our FBL principal base of operation from Painfield to Scottsdale. And what was taking us years to get up on certificate, we got up in six months. Uh, 10 years ago, it cost $10,000 per hour to fly that aircraft. That is fuel, pilots, and maintenance. This window right here, cracked in flight at 30,000 feet, $60,000 to replace that window. It is seven layers thick. So you may get one or two layers cracking, but you don't normally get the full uh, cracking all the way through the window. But that, did call, uh, that cracked over Portland. They turned around and hunted with back to Payne Field. Uh, aborted their flight. And the uh, fire actually came out on the runway for them, too. They didn't need it, but uh, the fire department thought it was good practice. Taxes. Excise tax and segment tax. So IRS Publication 720 is how you file these taxes. These taxes are not only just for airplanes. These are railroad taxes. Uh, all these extra types of taxes are filed under 720. Uh, part 26 of this is going to deal with transportation of persons by air. And for 2018, your domestic segment tax uh, for each airport you land at is $4.10. Uh, if you go to Hawaii or Alaska, it is $9.10. Um, if you go leave the United States and go international, or if you're going international into the United States, it is $18.30. This is per person on board your aircraft. If it is a rural airport, there is no segment tax. So like if you're landing at the very small airports in Monroe or Snohomish, you also pay 7.5% federal excise tax on your flight. Um, oh, cargo flights have their own set of taxes too. And they're filed under the 720 also. 
Okay, coronary reports. Here's the spherical law of cosines. And it gets ugly. Um, so the first uh, one in here, this is uh, distance in nautical miles. And then we want to take that nautical miles divided by 400 nautical miles per hour that the aircraft can fly to get the number of hours. And then times that hour, number of hours by $10,000 to give us our rate. And we want all, we're going to originate at Seattle and we don't want to land at Seattle. We'll pick any other airport but Seattle to land at that has jet A fuel and has a runway length greater than 5,000 feet and is less than 3,000 nautical miles away because we want to be able to fly, fly there on a single tank of fuel. Um, by the way, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with this order by statement. I actually did output a field here. This is a numerical position on the output of the select statement. So uh, this is position one, which is your airport name. Position two is identifier. Position three is your distance in nautical miles. So it's going to sort the output from the closest airport to the furthest away airport. And I think Las Vegas down here. So that's a fun place to fly to. It's 752 nautical miles. Takes 1.8 hours to fly there. And is almost $19,000 to fly that aircraft there. With all its maintenance and everything. Here's the same formula with the Haverstein formula. So it's even more complex in its math. Doing the same exact thing. Now, here's that same query with PostGIS. You notice instead of taking up the full page, it's only half the page. Much, much simpler. We just do the ST distance, give it the originating airport, the destination airport, divide it by 1,000 to turn it into kilometers, times that by the 0.53996 to give us our nautical miles, which is what we calculated our price by. So divide that by 400 nautical miles per hour to give us our number of hours, and then times that by $10,000 an hour. We also want to round it to the correct penny, and that's our rate that we're going to uh, use. Uh, then we can also do distance down here uh, to say all airports are less than 3,000 miles, 3,000 nautical miles. So, and there we got the Las Vegas again. Now, this version uses STD with, uh, STD within uh, down here in the join statement. Uh, we can say, is our destination airport within 3,000 nautical miles of our originating airport? Um, you may wish to use one way or the other, but I just decided to give you uh, both variations in here so you got to see how they worked. Now, when you want to add the taxes in, it gets more ugly again. It would get simpler, actually, if you did out, uh, inner queries and then outer queries, because you could just reference the field name instead of having to describe all the math again. Uh, but in here, we're going to look at if it's a rural airport or not. Uh, we're going to look at whether it's Alaska or Hawaii, if it's a state or out of country, and be able to figure out all the taxes. So this figures out all the taxes. And so down here we have our federal excise tax, which is our 7.5%. And we have our segment domestic segment tax, and actually this would be international too. Um, but that's our $49.20 for our 12 passengers. Um, this is a visualization, a visualization out of QGIS where I have loaded the state level data into it and am showing all the airports that that airplane could fly to. So you can see it can reach Hawaii, it can go up in Alaska, get down into Central America, but it can't make Europe in a single flight. Uh, it would actually have to um, stop out here and refuel and then do its next segment over. Same thing if it wanted to go to Japan, it has to start, stop partway and refuel. QGIS, free and open source geospatial to display your data, which is what I was just showing. It takes many, many different data sources. It can hook into Postgres. It can hook into other geospatial databases 
but it can also take the shape files directly and display them. It, even if the shape file is zipped, it can take that zipped shape file, it will unzip it in the background and use it. You don't need to uh, unzip it for it. So it's a great way to display your data. It is available Windows, Linux, Mac, 32-bit, 64-bit. Uh, they've got an Android experimental version out. Uh, great way to actually visualize your data. So here I am using the uh, country level data, admin data, with all the airports that I have in my airport database. You can see there's a massive amount here in the United States, but you get out into Northern Africa or out into parts of Russia, there's not as many airports out there. Here's Washington State and all the airports in there. Now, notice this weird outline. This is the Tiger data set. The Tiger data set goes out into the water and covers our territorial boundary, where if you use the world data set, it will actually go to the shape of the land. So depending on which one you want, you may use, use, use one data set or the other. They're similar, but not the same. Now, here's a tint in the background that was describing. The airport's loaded, and I've actually loaded the primary rows and the secondary rows onto here also, along with the county boundaries from the admin data set. Uh, so they shape the land. They also shape the water here, where if you use the census data, you will, the county boundaries will actually go out into the middle of the water. Here are King and Snohomish County. I live in Snohomish County, but work in King County, so these are all the airports. By the way, these include 25-foot runway airports, which are your hello pads. So that's why you definitely want to look at the runway line. Once you reduce it, say, okay, I'm on any runway over 5,000 feet, you have a lot less airports. Google API. Um, this is uh, present out of a slide I gave here many, many years ago where I said I want to fly out of Bellingham with that Challenger 601 and wonder all the airports I can land at. And these are them, and I threw them up on uh, Google. Um, you can do that, it's easy to do. I don't give an exact example here. Uh, Microsoft Big Maps is capable of it. Books. Mastering Post GIS is a good book for you. Uh, I have the table of contents here and even more data about the book uh, in the notes. Uh, PostGIS Essentials, PostGIS Cookbook. And here's a few references, but actually go to all the notes. There's a ton more references. Um, any questions? Yeah. So Rather than creating two tables, one for geometry, one for geography? No, no, it's two fields. Two fields, okay. One table with two fields. Could you just use, could you just, when you make your calculations, um, cast that? Too slow. Too slow? Too slow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's for, for performance reasons, you want both of them in there if you're doing both 2D and 3D map on. If you're only doing one type of map or the other, then you only need one version. But if you're, if you're wanting to do both types of math, which is what I was doing here, you want both versions. Okay. Makes sense. So. Any other questions? Well, I guess that's it. Get out a little bit early. Thank you. If you want to look at these aviation maps, this is a 